Welcome. In this video, we'll learn about quantum Fourier transform. It is not an overstatement that quantum Fourier transform is the most important quantum algorithm that is wide applicability. Quantum Fourier transform is related to rotations and hence we'll start with that. In fact, Every operation on a single qubit can be viewed as rotation on the block sphere. For viewers not familiar with this concept need not worry as this representation is not strictly need to understand the algorithm I am going to present. The block sphere representation is just a visual aid. For quantum Fourier transform, we'll primarily use rotations about the z-axis. The gate Z phi represents rotation by angle phi about the Z axis. Action of any gate can be fully specified by giving the action of the gate on the computational basis. Z phi keeps state 0 unchanged, but multiplies the state 1 by a phase factor e to the power i phi. As a matrix, we represent this gate as follows. Quantum Fourier transform uses a discretized family of Z phi gates we call ZK gates. For a given positive number K, the ZK gate rotates the state about Z axis by an angle 2 pi by 2 power K. It is important to keep in mind at this point is that the quantum computer has to implement these gates internally for each value of K. So the efficiency of algorithms that use these gates need to take into account the cost of implementing these gates. That is, we assume that if the algorithm uses Z100, then the quantum computer is capable of rotation about Z axis by an angle 2 pi by 2 power 100. This is an incredibly small angle. But, there is a deep theorem that implies that we can approximate these small rotations with desired accuracy with not too much of expense. This can be subject of another video. Another gate that is ubiquitous in quantum algorithms is the Ottomar gate. Its primary use is to create uniform superposition of computational basis. Ottomar gate converts 0 into 0 plus 1 and 1 into 0 minus 1. On the block sphere, it can be decomposed into two rotations, first apply rotation about the y-axis by 90 degree and then apply rotation about the x-axis by 180 degree. I'll talk about block sphere representations in detail in another video. As a matrix it can be represented as follows. It is useful to express the action of the Ottomar gate on a qubit in state J as follows. This is based on the following identity. In addition, we can write J by 2 as 0 point J just like how we use decimal places in the case of division by 10. Suppose we want to rotate a state about Z axis by an angle 2 pi by 2 power K times J. This can be achieved by repeatedly applying ZK gate J times. But this method is not efficient or practical when J is a large number like 2 power 100. It would simply take too long to finish the process. There is a clever work around this problem but comes at a design cost. But first, let us look at the binary expansion of J. Suppose J is an n-bit number. When we divide J by 2 power K, we can partition the terms in two parts, the green part contains fractional terms and the red part contains the integral terms. We can exploit the decimal representation to write binary fractional parts after a dot. The advantage of separating the fractional and integral parts is that when we consider e power 2 pi i j by 2 power k, the integral part corresponds to e power integer multiple of 2 pi i which is 1. In turn, the resulting expression can be written as product of k factors. This implies that zk power j can be obtained by only k rotations, 
but they all correspond to different angles and they depend on the bits of J. When some bit is zero, then the corresponding factor is identity, that is, it does no rotation. This means we need to implement controlled version of ZK gates. A controlled operation takes a control qubit as input such that the operation is active only when the control qubit is in state 1. When the control qubit is in state 0, the gate acts as identity. In case of controlled rotation ZK, it can be expressed as follows. Here the state C acts as control. The phase that the state 1 picks is non-trivial only when C is 1. At this point, it might give us an impression that it is already hard enough to rotate states by small angles, requiring the rotation to act only when some control qubit is in state 1 will make things worse. Unlike classical computation, here the control has to be quantum mechanical and must work in case the control qubit is in a superposition state. Next, we show that luckily this is not that much a problem when we have control not gates. In the case of rotation by ZK, all we need is two C not gates and ZK plus one gate, and its inverse to implement the controlled version of ZK rotation. Notice that ZK plus one gate rotates by an angle which half of what ZK does. The inverse gates is simply rotation in the opposite direction. The ZK plus one gate on the control qubit on the top is need for the phase factor. The idea is that first introduce phase factor by half angle in the one state, then swap the zero state with one using C not gate. Then, apply the inverse rotation which introduces a negative angle on the new one state. Taking this angle common gives the required rotation on zero state which can be flipped back by the next C not gate. I encourage you to go through the following rigorous calculation to convince yourself that this gate does achieve the desired effect. Now that we can implement controlled rotation, we can revisit the problem of computing any desired power of ZK rotation. We use bits of J as controls for appropriate Z rotations. Although order is not important, we first the most significant bit JK-1 is control for Z1 rotation. This rotates the state 1 by the angle 2 pi JK-1 by 2. This idea is then followed by other bits with rotations such that we get J by 2 power K as required in the phase. This idea is a significant step in our ability to implement quantum Fourier transform. The quantum Fourier transform uses a slightly different variant of the power idea I just described. The difference is that instead of starting with Z1 gate, this circuit begins with Z2 gate. The effect is that the most significant bit is shifted by one place in the decimal representation. Another change is that we are using only K-1 bits as control for division by 2 power K which was done using K bits in the previous case. I denote this circuit as the following controlled gate. Here the the black box labeled by ZK power K-1 indicates that the division of angle is done by 2 power K while only K-1 bits are used for control. Viewers already familiar with quantum Fourier transform will recognize that this gate is the most significant gate used in quantum Fourier transform, that is, we are almost done here. Now that we have done enough build up to quantum Fourier transform, it's time to motivate what it is and where does it come from. Quantum Fourier transform is quantum version of discrete Fourier transform which is ubiquitous in classical signal processing and algorithms. Discrete Fourier transform takes n complex numbers x0, x1 to xn-1 as input and outputs n complex numbers y0, y1 to yn-1. 
These numbers are related by the following expression. Notice that for complex numbers, multiplication by e power i, some angle rotates that complex number by that angle. Quantum Fourier transform is obtained by considering the computational basis as input, such that each basis vector is transformed to a superposition state, in which the amplitudes are the same as those in the discrete Fourier transform. As with any transformation, we need to show that it is unitary. Since the computational basis is orthonormal, the quantum Fourier transform basis must be orthonormal as well. To show this, we need to pick any two basis vectors and compute the inner product of the transformed vectors. Say, we pick J1 and J2. Just to be clear, these J1 and J2 are not single bits, these are log n bit numbers. We take the dual state of the first transformed vector and inner product it with the second transformed vector. This inner product is distributive and we can multiply it term by term. The result can be partitioned into two groups. The first group has terms with same k and l, values and the second group has the rest. Due to orthonormality of the computational basis, the inner products in the first group are 1 and the inner products in the second group are 0. I leave it for you to verify that the following geometric sum is 0 when J1 is not equal to J2 and 1 when they are equal. This shows that quantum Fourier transform takes orthogonal states to orthogonal states and their norm is 1. Hence quantum Fourier transform is allowed by quantum mechanics. The next thing we show is that the transformed vectors are factorizable. After this the circuit for quantum Fourier transform becomes apparent. For simplicity, we assume that the big N is a power of 2. Then the numbers j and k are n-bit numbers such that bits in their binary expansion correspond to states of qubits. The proof of factorizability of the transformed vector is like an exercise in string concatenation. Hence, instead of using tensor product notation, I have just separated terms like strings. It is amazing how exponential amplitudes and qubit states pair with each other. Expanding the sums, we see that qubit states are separate factors. The factorizability implies that we can target each qubit independently. We can map the input qubit states to output qubit states in order as follows. Notice we almost know how to get this target states using controlled rotations. But we transform the states in the following manner. Then all we'll be left to do is to rewire the bits at the right location using swap gates. Here is the final circuit that implements quantum Fourier transform. Before applying controlled rotations, item R gate is applied to each qubit to create the superposition with an added advantage that the first bit in decimal part comes for free. This completes the description of quantum Fourier transform. Regarding small rotations, it is necessary to remark that we can work with approximate rotations. This does introduce some error but we can account for it by repeating the algorithm that uses quantum Fourier transform a few times. Quantum Fourier transform forms the basis of many algorithms. We'll start with using it to add two numbers in the next video. If you like this content, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. See you in next video.